Hi, this is Dr. A with a clean camera review video on toxicology. We're going to look at analysis requirements. All right, blood in urine are usually the specimens of choice for toxicology testing, but you do need to recognize that toxic agents can exhibit unique absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination kinetics or toxicokinetics. And so for, you know, some toxins, to you know, um, xenobiotics and all that kind of stuff, it, you know, blood might be helpful, more helpful. Some of them urine might be more helpful. But either way, the detection window for blood is usually within hours of exposure and for urine is within days of exposure. Uh, you can also collect post-mortem samples uh, if the patient has died uh, for forensic testing. Uh, fluids that can be collected are eye fluid, stomach fluid, and cerebrospinal fluid. Um, on the analysis, it's usually a two-step procedure. Um, first, you, you start with a screening test, which would be a rapid, simple, qualitative procedure, a positive, negative kind of thing, right? And it's intended to detect specific substances or classes of toxicants. Um, and it has good analytic sensitivity, but it lacks specificity. So it will pick up on it, uh, on, like on an opiates, but it won't tell you what type it is. Or it'll pick up on an amphetamine, but it won't distinguish between an Adderall or a methamphetamine and stuff like that. Uh, and then these can be uh, followed with a confirmatory test, and a confirmatory test is a lot more specific. Um, and it is used to confirm a positive result from the screening test, uh, or sometimes get more specific there on uh, what class, you know, with, if it's within a class, which drug is actually there. The analytic methods that are often used in toxicology are immunoassays uh, for screening, especially. Thin layer chromatography is another one, uh, along with gas chromatography and ICP mass spectrometry and atomic absorption spectrometry also. A little bit on adulteration uh, for the drugs of abuse testing. Uh, adulteration is defined as the tampering with or manipulation of a urine specimen with the intention of altering the test results. Um, the use of adulterants then, of course, can cause false negative results. Um, adulteration can be tested by performing a creatinine, um, so you're testing for the dilution of the urine, a pH, a specific gravity, and then, of course, testing for some of the adulteration substances. Um, some of the ways around that is having a supervised collection where you actually witness the person peeing in the cup and a temperature strip to make sure that the urine that's coming that they're handing to you is actually body temperature. Uh, a little bit again on screening and confirmation of drug of abuse testing. If you do, um, uh, a lot of hospitals perform drug of abuse testing, uh, and when they do, it usually includes the statement results are to be used for medical purposes only, or it's a presumed presumptive positive. So it's because um, a lot of the hospitals and clinics use the rapid tests, which are immunoassays, which are really only screening tests. Um, then a GCMS has to be ordered for confirmation tests if that is needed. Uh, another way to detect substances is the osmolar gap. So an elevated osmolar gap provides an indirect evidence of the presence of an abnormal solute that is dissolved in the blood. That would be the osmolar gap is the difference between the measured osmolality and the calculated osmolality. Uh, and then we can also do neonatal drug testing. It is often performed on the meconium sample. A meconium sample is the first bowel movement of the infant. Uh, and that is often done if uh, it is suspected that the mother was abusing drugs to check for exposure of the infant to the drugs. And then a little bit on chain of custody. So uh, chain of custody is a process that has to be followed for evidence to be legally defensible, uh, which means acceptable to courts and governmental agencies. Evidence collectors must be neutral parties who have no personal interest in the test results. Uh, it is chain of custody is designed to maintain control and accountability. And there's thorough documentation of everybody that's involved with the specimen. Uh, and the specimen and forms uh, the specimen has to be permanently sealed with it in tampered evident containers and the documents have to stay with it. Uh, and those are specific chain of custody forms. They have uh, signature areas where you know the patient has to sign and uh, the collector has to sign. And then um, you know every basically every person that interacts with the sample has to sign on this chain of custody form. 
and that makes the whole uh, process admissible in court. And so very important to do that properly. And that is the last on testing.